You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hi, Will. Hello, David. Hello, listeners, and welcome to episode 43 of the Common Descent Podcast. We are back in different states as it is meant to be. We are, yes, we are <laughs> back in our original place. Today, we are talking about the Great American Biotic Interchange. Oh, I would sure wish you had a shorter term that we could use for that. It's known to its friends as Gabby. Ah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> the Gabby is certainly one of the top most important geological events of the last 60 million years or so. This is the event when North and South America reconnected after tens of millions of years of separation when the Isthmus of Panama was created. And it led to all sorts of interesting side effects, including a huge exchange of northern critters with southern critters. This shaped the ecosystems we have today. We're going to talk about what it was like before the Gabby, what it was like during the Gabby, what it's like now, and which of the creatures that we are familiar with today were inherited in their current position from this event. Yeah, what, what, what animals would we not have if this had never happened? <laughs> yes. This is a much-requested subject. It was requested by Nick on Twitter, John on Facebook, and Today by Nils on Patreon. Yep. Like six hours ago before yeah. this recording. <laughs> this episode's a little bit of a weird one because we're recording later than usual, <laughs> uh, which might show... We're also just a little bit out of voice. I can feel my voice being a li just a little bit more strained because if we move on to our announcements, Will and I just spent our last weekend over in Atlanta at Dragon Con. Yes, we did. And it was awesome. Oh my gosh, it was so much fun. Huge shout out to the fans we met there, people who already knew us. Yes. Huge shout out to our new fans listening now because they heard of us and saw us at Dragon Con. Yeah, thanks for everyone who showed up at our at any of our panels. Yes, the Jurassic World panel was awesome. It was so much fun. Also, a huge shout out to our new friend Trevor. Oh my god, yes. Trevor Valley, who was our co-panelist yep. on the Jurassic World panel. Who turns out Trevor's fantastic. It 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 was Wonderful in every respect. I can't. I have no complaints about how that panel went. It was amazing. It was. We have a, a thousand other pit announcements here. So real quick. Yep. <laughs> as longtime listeners know, we love our patrons. And one of the things that we will give our patrons of a certain level in reward for their support is we will shout their names out in gratitude on the podcast. For this episode, we would like to welcome to the Patreon fold Demi and Samuel M, and Luke, and Samuel A, and Steven. Yeah, welcome, everyone. Welcome, people. Now, because we're recording late, some of those would have been on the next episode. Yes. But we caught a couple extras. Welcome. Thank you so much. Everyone, take a look at our Patreon if you feel like contributing more to us. It's growing every day, and there's all sorts of cool bonus stuff that you get. Other announcements... By the time this episode comes out, we will have released our first two episodes of our September Spotlight series. Yeah. In this series, we are interviewing paleontologists about their research and other work. The theme we've chosen is invertebrate paleontology. So by the time you're listening to this episode, you should be able to listen to our interviews at least with Dave and Adrian. So check those out. They will be coming out every Saturday in September. If you like it, let us know, and we'll do more Spotlight with different people or a different theme in the future. Happily. It was a lot of fun making these. Speaking of other series, you remember in June when we did that Jurassic Park series and we talked about each of the movies and the science of it? We do. We called that, we, we labeled that as a But We Digress series. Well, we're retconning it. We're going back and we are relabeling it. Uh, under a new title, Silver Screen Science. 
Yes. And the reason we're giving it a new label is because we're continuing it. And sometime soon, after this episode comes out, we will be releasing the next installment, a single episode about a certain shark movie. Indeed. So keep your eyes out for that. It's going to be big. <laughs> and th also, also, another special series. Boy, we like giving ourselves work. Yeah. It's this how, one was suggested how by... How else are we going to not sleep? <laughs> one of our patrons suggested it, and it was such a cool idea, we decided we had to do it. Not going to say much about it now. Just know that in throughout the month of October, there will be a series that we are calling Spookulative Evolution. Yee. So lots of cool stuff coming up, and e there will be even more announced in upcoming episodes. But for now, let's cut it off there. And before we move on to our exciting topic for the episode, let's talk about some news. Every episode, we discuss some news from the world of paleontology, evolutionary science. Will, kick us off, please. Happily. My first bit of news is a really cool one that's popped up about some uh, ancient wasps that Ooh. have been found. Not just any kind of wasp, though. These are parasitoid wasps, and they were found using synchrotron x-ray microtomography to look inside of fossilized cocoons, pupa. When they looked in, they found a number of parasitoid larval wasps. These are wasps that feed on other insects, uh, or their young feed on other insects to survive. And so this is a really cool finding, and ki kind of the first of its kind, or at least for this size of the finding, Typically, they're not found like this, so this is a big deal. The research that we're looking at here was done by Thomas Van, Van de Kamp et al., and is published in Nature Communications. The article that we're going to be linking to is uh, written by Enrico de Lazaro in Science News, or Sci News. So, quick intro on background of paras parasites and parasitoid wasps so that we can get all of our terms correct. So, parasites are creatures that feed off of other organisms, uh, not eating them usually, but just eating parts of them to survive. Yes, parasites don't want to kill their hosts usually. Typically, and we're going to talk about that in a second, but cool stat that the researchers put out, it is estimated that about 50% of all animal species on Earth could be classified as a parasite. Cool. So parasitism is a very successful life strategy. Parasitoid wasps are especially numerous group that shows this kind of behavior. They're Within Hymenoptera, this is bees and ants and wasps and sawflies. The parasitoid wasps are a group that lays their eggs on or near a host, typically another arthropod. So insects and spiders are very popular for their targets. And the larva will feed on the host, either inside or externally, once it's ready to pupate, once it's ready to cocoon and mature into an adult, it will leave the host, usually killing it. Like a chestburster. Like a chestburster. This is one of the few times where parasites kill the host, and that's why they're parasitoid. They're kind of a mixture between parasite and predator, because they do end up killing their food item, just not right away. So, that's what we're dealing with. These are extremely numerous. Uh, they have to be because parasitoid wasps typically only hunt a single host. So it'll be a species per species of prey item. With that being the case, you would think they'd be very common in the fossil record, but they've typically been very rare, usually only finding adults or uh, larvae near their host in like amber or something. But there's not been a lot of times where we can, unless we can identify it as a parasitoid, you know, from a group we recognize or see evidence like it being near a host, typically we don't get to see a lot of evidence of the parasitism going on. Until now, the researchers here used their fancy x-ray to analyze 1,510 fossilized fly pupae. And so that's the fly cocoons. These are uh, phosphate fossils, which actually can preserve very high detail. So good stuff. Uh, from France, dating back to the Paleogene, estimated at about 40 to 34 million years old. Looking at all of these cocoons, they used x-ray to look through and see detailed uh, inner images. And through doing this, they came up with 55 cases of parasitism. 
what a cool concept that is. That yeah. you can scan a fossilized organism to find the parasitic fossilized organism inside of it. They have an amazing graphic that is actually animated that goes on that's on a lot of the news sites. It'll be on the one we're linking to. And if you hit play, it scans through the cocoon and shows the inside and then it scans back through it and highlights the baby wasp hiding inside. That's so awesome. And then you can see every bit of the wasp. It's amazing. It we are living in the future, folks. It's here. We made it. It's really, really cool stuff. Now, the extra cool thing about this is not only were they able to identify parasitoid wasps, but because this is a fairly new thing to be able to do, every, they've identified four new species. Nice. We have Coptera anca and Paleortona quercinensis. And then the final two have the best genus name of just about anything out there. It is Xenomorpha Resurrecta and Hanshini. <laughs> Heck yeah. Good names. These are absolutely named after the Xenomorphs from the Alien movie franchise. Chessbursters. Going back to that te- chessburster, specifically the second movie, they call them Xenomorphs, which means unknown. It's a, a, a amorphous form. Mm-hmm. But these are basically the same life cycle as the Alien movie Aliens. I am constantly amazed at what we can find in the fossil record yes and it's stuff that i spend a lot of time obviously talking about fossils and thinking about how things can fossilize i never thought about finding parasitoids inside of other creatures in the fossil record Uh, it made sense if you had asked me last year do you think you could find that i would have said yeah sure but i've never actually thought about it so when I see a new study that's something I never would have thought to look for, it's just so much fun. Well, and, and that's actually a really good point because uh, these these cocoons, these pupae, have a fairly long history for when they were actually described. They were described in 1944. <laughs> and they've just been sitting around. By Edward Hanshin, which you can see Hanshini mm-hmm. as one of the species names. This, this Swiss entomologist discovered them, described them, and noticed slight contours that made them suggest that there were likely parasitoid wasps effects going on, but there was no way to confirm it back then. And then they've just been sitting, I think it was the Natural History, um, the the Museum of Natural History, uh, it's just been sitting in their collection since then. Just kind of lost to antiquity until they came around with high-tech stuff. Speaking of new species and the progression of time, my first news piece is an article about a new species of turtle from the fossil record. Yay. But not just any turtle, a very early turtle, a transitional turtle. If any of our listeners are familiar at all with turtle evolution, they will know why this is exciting, (laughs) because early turtle evolution is almost a complete mystery. Yep. We know very little about how turtles came about, and especially where they fit on the reptile family tree. They're one of those groups that just kind of, for the most part, show up in the fossil record as what we know them as. Yep. There are a small number of very ancient partial turtles, which is to say turtles that, animals that have some of the turtle traits, but not all yet. And now we have a new one. In a study published in Nature by Chun Li et al., and we'll link to an article written in Nature by Jeremy Ram, this new turtle is called Eorhynchochiles sinensis, which means, roughly, early beaked turtle from China. That's a very accurate name. This turtle is about 230 million years old, from the Triassic period of China. It's big. It's about two meters in length. Wow. So about six feet. So it's it's roughly Will or David sized. Yeah, that's not that's that's decent. It has a disc like body, which is pretty characteristic of early turtles. Sort of not a shell quite, but just very expanded ribs. A long tail, and very excitingly, a beak. It's one of the only early turtles known with a proper toothless beak, which is a characteristic feature of turtles today. 
Some of the other ancient turtles have mouths with teeth in them, which you'd expect. They evolved from toothed reptiles. The fact that this new turtle shares the beak with modern turtles, but also has other features associated with earliest turtles and not necessarily showing an, a direct order of when certain things evolved, like other features of the body, other features of the skull, because there are some later turtles that don't have a beak mm -hmm. in, the early, in the Triassic period, suggests that there may have been what is called mosaic evolution, which is that it's not that each trait of the group showed up one after the other after the other, but that in the earliest ancestral family grouping, these traits showed up one or more times, and the group that we eventually got was the one that had all of the traits we associate with them with. Yeah. So the beak might have happened more than one time in Turtles. The other thing that's really interesting about this is the authors are very confident, we'll see how this pans out, but they are very confident that this turtle solves the question of where turtles fit on the reptile family tree, at least partially. Ooh. Ooh. So turtles have been linked to... I, some some studies have placed them with lizards and snakes. Some studies have placed them with crocs and dinosaurs. Some studies have said that they are a completely different group. It, it's It's a whole big confusing mess. But one of the classic arguments is, are they at the very least part of the diapsid reptiles, which includes pretty much all the reptiles you think of when you think reptiles, snakes, crocs, etc. Or are they a separate group, the anapsids? The big difference is the jaw attachments in the back of the skull. Diapsids have two pairs of openings in the back of the skull for jaw musculature. Anapsids do not. One of the earliest turtles is a genus named Odontochiles, which means tooth turtle. Yep. From about 10 million years later than Eorhynchochiles, it has partial shell, bottom shell, part of the top shell, and no holes in the skull. Very much like modern turtles, which isn't very helpful because it's it's even while the shell was developing and stuff, we already had this skull condition. Mm -hmm. There is an earlier genus at around 240 million years ago named Papochiles, which also has a partial shell, bottom only, and has two pairs of openings in the skull, the classic diapsid condition, which some people have said, all right, well, that's an early turtle and it proves that it's linked to diapsids. Mm hmm. Eo Rinkochiles not only fits exactly in between the timing of those two, but has a skull structure intermediate between the classic diapsid condition and the modern turtle condition. Nice. The article that uh, we will link suggests that it essentially has one pair of holes instead of two on the way from two to zero. Nice. In the press release for this study, one of the authors says, The debate is over. <laughs> Whoa. That this is a diapsid lineage. Which, he might be right, and that would be pretty cool. Doesn't quite solve the question of where exactly they fit, but it at least helps to narrow it down, which is pretty exciting. Very cool. Lots, lot, I, I will look forward to future research done on this this turtle to see what else we can tease out of it because it's the tur the question of who are turtles yes. has been has been a big weird one for a long time so it'd be very cool if this one is a actually able to place them somewhere that would be really neat we shall see the turtle mystery uh continues very cool well Speaking of reptiles, this article, this bit of research is on uh, marine marine reptile tooth analysis, looking at how they are affected by changes in sea level. The research for this article is done by David Fofa et al. and published in uh, Nature, Ecology, and Evolution. The article we'll be linking to again is uh, by University of Edinburgh in phys.org. So this research is focusing on a specific area, a specific time, and specific animals. So it's actually looking at this area and how changes within it affected 
not like the evolution of those animals, but the structure of the ecosystem there more so. Hmm. The ecosystem we're looking at is the Jurassic Subboreal Seaway in the UK. This is an area stretching from north of France to just north of England today. There used to be a tropical seaway there during the Jurassic, and they are looking there to look at how changes in the sea level height and uh, things like that affected the animals that live there. So what they did is they looked at teeth. For this study, focusing on marine reptiles, and they weren't going by species, but instead uh, the morphotype, the shapes of the teeth, and classifying them to, as they put it, five guilds for tooth shape that would be analogous to different feeding mechanisms, uh, feeding techniques. Okay. And the five guilds they had were cutting, piercing, generalist, smash, and crush. Nice. <laughs> and crunch. Crunch is the last. But yeah, it's it's... Ones who cut, ones who are piercing and grabbing, ones who are smashing things, ones who are crunching on stuff, and then your generalists that are eating a little bit of everything. And they were looking at how these, the diversity within these shapes shifted and increased and decreased, and what was also going on during that time to try to look for trends in the ecological uh, pattern of this area. So the main trend that they came across was as sea levels rose, they saw a decrease in diversity of piercing-toothed predators and an increase in diversity of the cutting and crunching toothed guilds. And the conclusion they drew from this is that the piercing-toothed predators are thought to be going after fish. That's typically what right. skinny, piercing, hook-like, or spear-like teeth are used for, is grabbing fish or squid, small aquatic animals, that you need to hold on to because they're going to be wriggly. Yeah. And these are typically going to be shallower water, you know, where these little fish are going to be spending a lot of their time. Not potentially, not, you're not necessarily always, but that that's where the density of those were found or the higher density of those were found. Cutting teeth are for large prey items. That's a very common trend. If you are eating something bigger than your mouth, you need to cut it into pieces. And crunching are going to be used for hard exterior prey items like sh shellfish and crustaceans and stuff like that and those predators that are going after tougher or bigger things often are deeper water where bigger animals are going to be and where things are going to be down at the bottom as these sea levels rose the deep water animals were doing better and the shallow water animals were doing worse interesting and it, yeah. it changed the ecosystem structure absolutely and they they were able to also notice a couple other things about this ecosystem so First off, they're seeing this trend, and this trend is significant because we are looking forward into our current future at potential sea level rises of some significance. So we might be seeing similar effects on sea life today, and there are some trends that match from the modern to this study as well. So it seems to hold true uh, even today. And they saw heavy niche partitioning which was what allowed all these different shapes to coexist without competing with each other is that through eating and living in different uh, roles and areas of the ecosystem, because they also were not all on top of each other spatially, they were able to avoid competition. And the cool thing about those two things is it all pretty much matches what we see in oceans today, which means that at least going back to, to the Jurassic, the ecological format for our seas and the life in it has been relatively conserved for 150 million years. Very cool. I like this. This is a cool example of a study where you can learn super neat things about ecosystems without ever identifying a species. Yes. Like they weren't saying mosasaurs and plesiosaur. They're just saying these are the shapes of teeth we found and what that tells us about our predator diversity which is a really interesting way to do that. So, you know, you you sidestep taxonomy altogether. And, and it's really fascinating because that allows you to make an even more direct comparison with ecosystems across time. Absolutely. Because even though today we don't have plesiosaurs and mosasaurs and whatever else. Uh, did you say this is Jurassic? This is Jurassic. So, so maybe not mosasaurs, but ichthyosaurs, things like that. 
we still have the same tooth shapes. Yeah, we still have piercers, crunchers, cutters, and smashers, and all of those good things. Yeah, some things don't change. And it's that's the thing I liked about it. Is, is it's the same way you can take a handful of shark teeth and talk about the sharks, even if you have no clue what each shark is. You yes. can still say something about what that shark was likely doing. <laughs> so yeah, I, I had fun with this one. Well, that's enough talking about really, really ancient things for this news section. For my second news piece today which might be my favorite news piece of the year. I have to say, it's it's pretty good. <laughs> this is an ancient human hybrid. Bear with me. So this is a study published... It's, it's not a bear. It's not a bear hybrid. Not a bear hybrid. Well, that was a different... <laughs> we could have chosen that one. That was a different, <laughs> right. It was a bear hybrid study. <laughs> this is a human we want to get our, hybrid. Our news sources crossed. Published by Vivian Sloan et al. in Nature. We'll be linking to the New York Times article by Carl Zimmer... You remember episode 18, we talked about the various different human species in the late Pleistocene. We had Homo sapiens, we had Neanderthals, and we had the mysterious Denisovans. In Siberia, a handful of teeth and tiny bones from a cave called Denisova Cave. Genetic information hinted at a separate population, lineage, species, subspecies, whatever, of ancient hominin. Over the last several years, we have come to learn that Neanderthals and Denisovans and humans all interbred. And we know that because modern, each of them has bits of DNA in their genome that were inherited from the other lineages. Humans today, like you are somewhere like 1% to 4% Neanderthal DNA because your great-great-great ancestors got busy with some Neanderthals at one point. <laughs> and whenever we talk about this, it's always this sort of deep in the past thing. Oh yes, yeah, some one somewhere in the distant past, sometime they interbred. Well, this study reports on the fifth official Denisovan specimen, and it is an individual that is a direct hybrid of Denisovan and Neanderthal. In twenty fourteen, Russian scientists collected a couple thousand bone fragments from Denisova Cave, wow. sent them to the Max Planck Institute to look for identifying features. One of them came back as hominin, and they tested some DNA in 2016 and found that the mitochondrial DNA, remember in episode 34, mitochondrial DNA is easier to get a hold of, matched Neanderthal. So they said, all right, that looks like it's probably Neanderthal. That's pretty cool. So they later in this study, worked on reconstructing the genome, the whole genome, including all of the nuclear DNA. And what the nuclear DNA showed us was that this was a female, and that while the mitochondrial DNA matched Neanderthal, half of the chromosomes matched Neanderthal, and the other half of the chromosomes matched Denisovan. That's so cool. Each chromosome pair was split. And mitochondrial DNA, for those of you who know your genetics, you will know, is inherited from your mother. Yes, it is. This was an individual whose father was a Denisovan and whose mother was a Neanderthal. And that is the coolest dang thing I think I've ever heard of in a hominin DNA study. It's, it's awesome. We caught the hybridization practically in the act. This right? is the direct child of a hybridization of an interbreeding between these two groups it's uh her um what is it the, the 23 me uh would be yes. very boring <laughs> <laughs> it'd be very uneventful it's, and you i you have a relative on your mother's side who is neanderthal yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> well actually what her 23 and me would say is that her father was a relative, a close relative of the other Denisovans in this cave, but her mother was not related to the Neanderthals found earlier in the record from Denisovan cave, but closer to Neanderthals from all the way over in Croatia oh. at a later time, which suggests that Neanderthals were moving around quite a bit. Yeah. That they, they weren't hanging out in one place all the time. Uh, were, as the centuries went on, it, yeah, that they were they were nomadic or something akin to that. This all suggests that, of Very course, we knew Denisovans and Neanderthals interbred. 
This event is about 90,000 years back, so they've been doing it for a while, but not frequently enough to mesh. They remained distinct lineages. Yes. One of the things that I've seen mentioned by uh, some of the the, the reporting, uh, some from the authors themselves, I think this was in the paper, is that the fact that they found the evidence of a hybridization suggests that mixing was common mm -hmm. when the two met. And I see where they're coming from, though I have a little bit of an issue with that statement. Because what they're suggesting is one out of our five Denisovan individual specimens in the world has evidence of hybridization. The odds of that are pretty low unless this was a common occurrence. Yes. But I also feel like it's worth pointing out that it's entirely possible we got like the one freak occurrence and it just happened to be our number five. Yeah. But they're probably right. It, it probably was more common than we may have thought. But it, lo logically speaking, <laughs> it's, it's still possible that we got a weird a, a weird one. It, it's one of those where at this point, uh, it's it's almost as likely to be rare as it is to be common because we we have a data point on that <laughs> yes yes one out of every five denisovans yep was the the direct result of it yeah that's probably not true but that is amazing it's that's so cool so cool well it's cool because it it can tell us things already like where the each each parent came from potentially and or which populations each parent came from potentially and give us even more insight into the so social is not quite the right word but the the population dynamics yeah those these. interactions between the two the groups yes that's what's interesting to me is the fact that we're getting a look at how these these groups met and what happened when they did it's cool. so neat just good stuff one more thing to mention in our news bit uh for this episode and we're going to bring the tone down a little bit here yes uh this is not fossil this is not research news. This is modern day world news that we should uh, make mention of. By the time this episode comes out, many people will have already heard about this. The National Museum in Rio de Janeiro uh, was victim to a fire on Sunday, September 2nd. Uh, this has been bouncing around the news. This is the largest natural history museum in Latin America. It was founded exactly 200 years ago, I believe. And the this has been big news in academic communities around the world because this wasn't like a little fire. This was a fire that consumed the building. Yeah. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the specifics and, and because this is a developing story. This just happened. By the time this episode comes out, our we our information would be outdated. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not even a week old at the moment. Yes. But just suffice it to say, the collections of the National Museum included tons of unique dinosaur, pterosaur, human remains, lots of fossils, as well as modern collections, as well as cultural artifacts. We know already that some things were lost. Yes. The about as last I heard, the entire entomology collection is gone. An estimated five million specimens of insects. The arachnid collection is done. Uh, a lot of other specimens were lost. A lot of them we don't know yet. Certain things were saved. Uh, a lot of the vertebrate collections, it sounds like, are still okay. Uh, the reptiles, fishes, birds, things like that. We don't know very much about. For example, the fossil collections, at least as of this particular recording, it is certain that other things were lost. It is certain that a lot of research and archival notes have been lost. This is a, this is a tragedy. This is absolutely devastating. This, this is centuries of collected material. This is countless number of people's careers of research, past and future people who are planning on working here it, it this is if if you know museum people and they're sad now this is why this is yeah. this has been a, a really difficult thing to read about especially because there has apparently been a history of this at this museum of issues that haven't been 
addressed. Yeah. Leaks and termite infections. I believe their sprinkler system wasn't properly functional, which is part of why the fire was so bad. There's been little support for this museum or for the research done there historically from the Brazilian government, or at least the sections of the government who are responsible for these things. So it really is just a very sad thing. We yes. wanted to mention it on the podcast to show our support for the people who are going through that and to make sure that people around the, you know, our listeners are made aware of it. There will be in the coming weeks, certainly opportunities for people to provide support, uh, potentially help. There's already been a call going out around the internet for photos and records that people have taken from the museum. So people who have photographs of things, so they're trying to get a whatever records they can. There will probably be, you know, there, there might be a call for donations at some point. Keep an eye on the story. And, you know, here in the United States, we're getting started on election season. Vote for people and governments who support museums and yes. who care for museums and academic collections. Be this is not the first time this has happened no. to a museum that was neglected to be cared for properly. Obviously, that's not always the case. Accidents do happen, but anything we can do to prevent this kind of thing, because this is, I mean, we, in a, in a night, we lost several million irreplaceable specimens of who knows how many different things. Yep. And it's, it's really terrible. So I saw, I saw someone who posted on Facebook musing whether or not this is what any of the people when the library of Alexander burned down of Alexandria. Yeah. yeah. If, I was, I, was, that came to my mind too. Yep. Yep. If that, this is a, this is a, a can't say for sure comparable, but this is definitely in that vein of, you know, the, there's not coming bouncing back from this. You can't No, this isn't a loss of property. It's, this is a loss of knowledge. Yes. And it sucks. It's, it sucks so bad. <laughs> So just wanted to put that out there. We'll put some links up in the blog post that are up to date as of that time. Uh, if you want to keep up with this, you know, look for more news. Cause like we said, this is, this will still be developing by the time this episode comes out, but our, our support for now, our verbal support goes out to the people struggling through this. And when the opportunity arises for us to do more, uh, we certainly will. So now we're going to use this, our little musical interlude as an opportunity to, to, to have a moment to shake off our somber feelings. And, and we will come back with our main topic discussion, re-energized, uh, back to our upbeat <laughs> conversational tone when we're discussing cool science. The Great Biotic Interchange comes up in just a moment. As far back as the late 1800s, naturalists, including the famous Alfred Russell Wallace, noticed mixtures of the animal life between North America and South America and proposed the, that the idea, the possibility of an interchange, animals crossing over between the continents. The phrase, Great American Biotic Interchange, was proposed in 1985. Around 3 million years ago, asterisk, stay tuned, North America and South America reunited after a very, very long time being separated. That is the subject of today's episode. What happened when the two great Western continents met up again? But before we get into the meetup, let's talk about the lead up to the meetup, South America. If you go back, you know, 200 million years or so, South America was, along with all the other continents, part of the great supercontinent of Pangaea. As time went on, Pangaea split in two to the southern supercontinent of Gondwana and the northern of Laurasia. Gondwana ultimately began to split east to west after that. 
South America and Africa had split up by around 110 million years ago. And over the next several tens of millions of years, South America gradually separated from Antarctica, which itself was connected to Australia, until by around 50, 55 million years ago, South America was completely off on its own. Even before then, there would have been, you know, limited interactions with other continents. So that means that while through the early part of the Cenozoic era, the, the era following the end of the Age of Reptiles, there was exchange with Australia and Antarctica and even with North America through various land connections, uh, possibly island arcs that would have left passages between them. After around 55 million years ago or so, South America appears to have been pretty much on its own. And anyone who's ever visited Australia or listened to our Madagascar episode, episode 40, knows what happens when you leave a landmass all by itself. Yep. Things tend to get a little bit weird. This is also the case of islands, episode 4. Yeah, what is a continent but a big island? Yes, and South America became a big island, an island continent, you know, cut off from the rest of the world, which meant that throughout the Cenozoic era, the Age of Mammals, while the other continents were sort of doing their thing and Europe and Asia and North America were exchanging critters, South America was pretty much coming up with its own ideas, mm -hmm. coming up with its own evolutionary innovations. So if you were to visit South America during most of the Cenozoic, you would encounter things like lots of weird metatherians, <laughs> including plenty of marsupials. Marsupials and a group called the Sparacidonts, which included things like opossums, including mm -hmm. at least one species of giant opossum, Thylophorops. Sounds terrifying. The marsupials and, and close relatives also made up the dominant mammalian carnivores of South America while the rest of the world was experimenting with crazy ideas like cats and bears. Never catch on. Yeah, they're, they're never going to make it. This is, no, it's never going to work. South America was coming up with things like Thylacosmilus, the saber-toothed marsupial. Yeah! And things like Macro-Euphractus. But carnivorous mammals were pretty limited. They were joined, if you go back to episode 37.5, we talked about these, by the terror birds... Yep. This was a continent where giant predatory flightless birds were part of the top predators. There were also a number of crocodilians. As there should be. Like the Sebesid crocodilians, uh, including some aquatic and some very large ones. This was the carnivore guild in South America. Very unusual compared to other mm -hmm. continents. On the other side, on the herbivore side... South America was home to lots of weird hoofed animals. Not, you know, once again, not horses and antelopes, but their sort of own versions of these. Not marsupials, you know, placental mammals, but th weird things like the notoungulates, the lightopterns, the xenungulates, things like uh, the famous macrocania, which I think we mentioned in a news piece uh, many, many episodes oh, yeah. ago which was kind of like a weird tall camel and things like homolototherium, which was kind of like a calicothere, which a calicothere is kind of like a gorilla horse. And I'm yeah. going to leave it at that. Things like trigodon, which was sort of rhino-like, sort, sort of these South American convergent answers to the popular hoofed animals that were showing up on the, on the rest of the world. That's probably one of the weirdest things, uh, or... I say weird is one of the coolest things to me, but definitely odd about the mammals of South America is when you look at Australia and the big mammals that they had to fill herbivore and carnivore roles, they look different. Like they look weird compared to, you know, a big herbivorous Australian marsupial does not look like our big herbivores at all. Like they look odd. A lot of the ones in South America, you could have confused for a lot of recognizable animals, but they were different. Like Yeah, different lineages. Thylacosmilus is my favorite example because 
if I if you just showed a picture of that to someone who did not know what it was, you'd say saber tooth cat. Yeah, very convergent. Just looks almost identical, except for a couple of things, because their fangs were open rooted and went above the eyes and were amazing. Yeah, they were ridiculous. They, that's that's my favorite saber tooth <laughs> creature because that's that's just awesome. They also had those chin flanges that are like sheaths for theirs. They d- yeah, they were. We'll put up a picture maybe if yes. that lack of smile is on the blog post. Yeah, South America was answering the same problems as the rest of the world mm-hmm. in some of the same ways. You know, with, with similar carnivores, similar herbivores filling those niches. They also had their own weird creatures, notably the Xenarthrans. Woo! Xenarthrin. We talked about Xenarthrans before, episode 24. The Xenarthrans are a South America, just a super weird group of animals. That includes such alien creatures as sloths. Uh, and for most of the Cenozoic, that meant ground sloths. Mm-hmm. Big. Anteaters, which are crazy weird. Armadillos, along with their relatives, the Glyptodonts, which were <sighs> d- often described as Volkswagen. Yep. You know, the big sh- armored creatures. And they the- look like an igloo walking around. They do. With uh, some, some of them had spikes. There were also the Pampatheers, which were also armored Xenarthrans. These were were a major portion of the South American continent. Another thing that you just didn't see elsewhere that was very uniquely South American. Mm-hmm. And that's armored mammals in general is not a common thing, but there was a number of them down there. That was a, yes, a, there were a trend there that, for whatever reason, didn't pick up almost anywhere else. Like, there's very few uh, uh, non xenarthran mammals that are truly armored. Very true. Very true. Which is cool. I, I just find that those kind of oddities intriguing. It, it Yeah, South America was coming up with weird ideas. It was also receiving imports from around the world. Some notable examples. So even though it was separated, we talked in episode four about how creatures can disperse across oceans. Mm-hmm. South America appears to have received from elsewhere from Africa notably, sometime in the Eocene or thereabouts, early in the Cenozoic, a group of rodents called the Caviomorphs, which you might be familiar with, including capybaras, chinchillas, guinea pigs, and the New World porcupines. Yeah. Also, perhaps in the Eocene, from Africa, they received monkeys. Yep. The platyrines, which we discussed in episode 7 with our friend Ethan, New World monkeys came over, perhaps rafted over like the rodents did, from Africa to South America. Uh, Bats showed up uh, early in the Cenozoic. Just on their own. Just because they're bats. (laughs) Other immigrants made it across. There are certain reptiles like tortoises and some lizards and snakes may have made it over there sometime during the earlier portion of the Cenozoic. Mm -hmm. So it was isolated, but it wasn't... You know, there were still opportunities for long-distance dispersal, but mostly it would have been these weird South American groups with little bits of long-distance travelers in there. A cool place. It would have been very, very bizarre to visit that place before the interchange. Yes. And meanwhile, over in North America, which uh, it will become part of our story very quickly... North America had much more familiar creatures. Felids, cats, saber-toothed cats, big cats like we know today. Canids, including ancient wolves and things like that. Ancient bears. Uh, These were the dominant carnivores elsewhere in the world. Asia had them, Europe had them, North America had them, Africa had them. Their herbivores included familiar things like tapirs and horses and camels and elephants, uh, rhinos, and they even had their own giant birds, the Brontornithes. So North America not only had a different ecosystem, a different set of creatures, but one that was shared more widely across the world. North America was still interacting with Europe and with Asia and with other parts of the world because there were still decent connections there for these creatures to be passing over and through. South America was very unusual and distinct. You'll also notice that the North American assortment 
is more familiar, which might be a little bit of a spoiler <laughs> as to how the interchange went. Yep. So this is the setup. This is where we're starting, right? We've got South America's got its own unique fauna. The rest of the world's doing its own thing. No one's really interacting much with South America. But as we reach, as we, we move through the Miocene epoch, especially as we approach the end of the Miocene, this begins to change. And this is, this is the part where the documentary series would dramatically say, what will happen when North meets South? Yep. This is it's, uh, the rumble of the ages where they're finally going to <laughs> rematch. Yes. So, the interchange approaches. For a long portion of the Cenozoic, North America and South America were separated by what was called the Central American Seaway, which linked the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean between them. The exact history of connections between North and South America is the subject of a lot of debate because land masses, small land masses can kind of come and go. Uh, connections can come and go. But generally, we won't go into too many geologic specifics so that we don't make any geologists upset. But generally, as the Cenozoic wore on, the Pacific Farallon tectonic plate subducted beneath the Caribbean plate and the South American plate. And this created uplift. So when you have one plate sinking under another plate, it pushes land upwards. And you get all this crazy melting effects that tend to cause volcanic activity. So you get volcanic arcs. This is why there's a ring of fire around the Pacific Ocean, because the Pacific is subducting underneath its neighbors on almost all sides. It's melting. It is. So as this subduction continues, you start to see uplift and islands forming across the Central American Seaway. Now, like I said, there is a very long history of this happening, but at the very least, there was a series of volcanic islands in the Central American Seaway as early as 12 to 15 million years ago. So the middle to late of the Miocene, which might have been a route. Now those might have created passage. It might have been close enough to allow some hopscotching. Yes. As you wear on, eventually you get more widespread uplift. You get more solid connections, shallowing seas, the Panama Isthmus, the Isthmus of Panama, was in place, pro properly in place, proper land connection, by around two and a half to three million years ago. There you go. This is when we finally, see, after several million years of maybe wishy-washy, you know, islands and uplifts and stuff. The two we, Americas we, finally commit. Yeah, they were, yeah, were kind of, <laughs> you know, thinking yeah. about it. They were kind of going back and forth. By the Pliocene, by the end of the Pliocene epoch and the beginning of the Pleistocene, you have an actual connection. The, the Isthmus of Panama has formed. But there was a lot of interchange before that. Which is interesting. So there's this sort of classic idea that the inter right you had, they were separated, they were separated, then the Isthmus formed, and then you had this big flowing of northern creatures to the south and southern creatures to the north. They'd all been waiting at the borders. Just just waiting to, waiting to go, waiting to get on the boat. But that's not how it happened. There is a long history of creatures from across that gap showing up in the other continent before the, uh, the, the, the passage properly formed. You will hear these referred to as waif dispersers, heralds, which I like. That's a good one. Or new island hoppers, <laughs> which sounds like a band. That's what I was about to say. That <laughs> sounds like a band. Coming up next, the new island hoppers. Yes, exactly. On 98.5, the waif. <laughs> nice. We talked in episode four about how creatures can get across waterways. Right, You can be carried across waterways on rafting vegetation or on, you know, in a storm if you're small enough. Mm -hmm. Little things can be travel carried by birds. Uh, but island hopping is a very popular way to imagine creatures making their way across waterways like this. Yeah. That you only need to disperse a little way across the water to get from island to island to island. 
And for some bigger animals, we see them do that today. Like Yes, we do. There are elephants who regularly visit islands because they can swim across the small channels with their trunk out like a little snorkel. And they just, a lot of them just walk across. Yes. <laughs> so it, if you're big, it may not be an issue. You may be able to actively do that on purpose. Indeed. Now, the biotic interchange, the gabby, was not only a mammalian thing. But our best understanding comes from mammals. And the most famous examples of, of animals traveling up and down are mammals. And indeed, the first, the earliest records of mammals making their way across the Central American Seaway is a group of large mammals. Yeah. They did not come from the north, but from the south. Ground sloths. Yep, we mentioned these. At least back to nine million years ago, long before the isthmus was, was was thought to have been properly formed, you had at least a couple of genera of ground sloths appearing in North America. You had things like Pliometanastes and Thinobidistes. Later on, you would see uh, Megalonyx, the yep. famous giant ground sloth. But you had a couple of early dispersers. And there are these wonderful discussions to be had, and we talked about this in episode 24, about swimming giant ground sloths. Yep. Is, were they paddling across these little stretches of water to get to new land where there'd be food for them? And I mean, considering that there are some ground sloths uh, or ancient sloths thought to be aquatic or semi-aquatic, it lends to that these animals may have just motored on over yeah you and you can imagine looking across the the channel and going well there's an island over there and it's not too far mm -hmm. i'm huge i can swim over there and then you get over there and you discover oh there's a lady sloth here who had the same idea yeah and then you do that over several generations and eventually you're in you know mexico yeah animals can be very pro i mean this is why alligators end up in pools is because they get kicked out <laughs> of a a lake where they finally got too big for the big male to allow them to stay there, and they go and find their own place. So they go searching. So, I mean, it, it's absolutely reasonable that you'd maybe get pushed out of where you were and start looking around and go, oh, I can see that there's, or I can smell that there's the right food over there. So let's go. Absolutely. And there also, you know, this would have been a probably several million year period of very volatile geologic activity. So you would have had uplifts here and there, you know, rising and then perhaps sinking land masses uh, on the islands, in between the islands. You would have had raising and lowering of sea level. So you might have had more of a land connection and less over time leading up to the time where you finally had a permanent link. So there could have been some overland dispersal, at least through parts of this seaway. When I, I got to visit Australia when I was younger, uh, uh, we went to we went to an island, and I don't remember the name of the island, but somewhere on the east coast. But we went to an island, and there was another island just next to, like, you know, a, a, a few hundred yards. I mean, not not ridiculous, but. Mm -hmm walking distance but far enough away that it wasn't right next to it but it was just off the coast of that island but they said that during especially low tides you could walk there because nice. it went down just enough and there was a sand bank that had gathered between those two points and so on particularly low tides yeah you could just stroll on out there and it was close enough that the walking distance didn't take longer than the tide did yeah so you can imagine even when there wasn't a permanent connection, you know, this millennium, the sea level is kind of low and it becomes much easier to traverse. Yeah. And you could get end up just strolling onto someplace and then the water comes back in and it, well, now you're there. Yes. And then you <laughs> look for the next island. Yeah. Among the first mammals to make it from North to South America, back to seven or eight million years ago, were the Procyonids. That is the group that includes raccoons and raccoon relatives like the Kawadi. Yeah, that's that surprising that they took advantage. No, they're pretty. They're they're pretty easy to make that trip. Yep. Uh, rodents began crossing, you know, both ways. Certainly by four, five, six million years ago, there's evidence that 
other herbivores made it across as the the the, the official exchange got closer including early peccaries and camels making their way from north to south a lot of these early dispersing mammals it's been pointed out uh, may have been either generalists like raccoons yeah which can eat pretty much anything and live in many different environments i mean there's a reason there are city raccoons it's if there's yep. food nearby they will be okay or animals that could do something living in a certain a way that meant that there was space available mm -hmm. right there's nothing quite like ground sloths in north america before ground sloths show up yes so these early dispersers may have been the ones that were best equipped to you know act as scouts to, to mm -hmm. be making little establishments moving across where others who might have tried it might not have been successful the quote-unquote weirder or more specific ones might not have faced competition as immediately yes now, like I said, most of our data is mammals, because the mammalian fossil record is quite good. But there's been a lot of genetic studies that have looked at modern groups and attempted to calculate their divergence. So you've got North American animals, South American animals. They're both part of the same group, like frogs. You got North American frogs, South American frogs. They're closely related. When did they split? Because that should give you an idea of when they made the jump mm -hmm. and there have been studies that have found that a lot of other animals may have been making the trip before the official interchange in those several million years leading up to it i've seen papers suggesting this in frogs in bees in tropical birds in plants i saw one paper that suggested that caimans did it that oh, caimans interesting. Uh, moved from north america to south america during the time where there was the closure was coming but it wasn't quite there was not quite an isthmus yet interesting uh, which is another one that if you're familiar with crocs and gators makes sense they tend to make trips across oh, yeah. big water very cool and then they took root there you know, caimans now are except for one small population in florida due to the pet trade now yes. isolated in south america uh and they've done well. Like, that's the cool thing also with a lot of these groups is where they've, you know, interchanges happen and they flourish. South America has one of the highest densities of crocodilian species in the world, if not the highest. I think they do have the highest for species overlap in territories. That is one of my favorite things about this story is going through it and going, OK, at this point in the story, there are armadillos in South America only. Mm -hmm. But I live in North America and I know. Yep. And just sort of, it, there's a lot of foreshadowing just from living in the world today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And getting the sense that this interchange already, but we haven't even talked about it yet. This interchange was a huge factor in shaping modern American ecosystems. And just watching these different groups of animals show up in the places that some of them are now famous for. Yeah, it's it's we are living in the aftermath of this event yes we are and speaking of this event uh we've done enough teasing enough preludes let's get to the interchange itself by 2.6 to 2.8 million years ago the isthmus of panama was officially in place forming a consistent land connection from north america to south america and this marked the beginning of the gabby proper Now, some scientists, geologists and paleontologists, have, have disagreements over what to characterize the Great American Biotic Interchange as to its beginning and end. Some propose that all the stuff we were just talking about is part of the Gabby, that the Gabby took a very, very long time. Others refer to sort of the traditional sense of the Gabby being once you had a dry isthmus passage, the classic, right, the, the major movement of creatures north to south occurs, sort of the classic Gabby proper, occurs from the early Pliocene through the late Pleistocene. 
over the course of 2.6 or so million years ago up until arguably still today. <laughs> we still see new organisms making this passage right up through the Ice Age into the modern day. This period of time, the biotic interchange of the Pleistocene occurs, and we're following, now I'm sure there's a lot of back and forth on this, we're following a couple of papers that describe this in, in detail, and we'll link those papers on the blog post so that you can see where we're getting these specific descriptions from. There are a handful of major pulses of exchange. So it wasn't that they connected and then suddenly there was a, a, con a constant flood. Mm -hmm. There were periods of time where you see a lot of new groups showing up in new places. And then in between those pulses, you have calmer periods where there's less exchange, sort of slower rates in between. Mm -hmm. Makes sense that it wouldn't be just a continuous flow. There's going to be things that affect it like the climate or any number of other environmental factors. Certainly true. Over the course of this time period, you would have seen changes in land area, right? Because it's still a geologically active place. So even though you have a passage, the specifics of that passage are going to change over time. Sea levels rising and falling, especially because this is when you start getting your major glacial cycles. Yeah. And the climate of the isthmus is constantly in flux. So depending on what the climate is, that's going to affect who gets to make the transition. Because mm -hmm. as much as we like to think, okay, well, there's a land connection now, anything with legs can move between continents, that's not the case. If you've got tropical forest all over the isthmus, your horses and camels aren't walking from North to South America. No. But at different times, you know... During warmer, humid climates, you would have had those tropical forests, which would have been great for things like birds and rodents. Even bird, because, you know, once again, birds, you think, well, they're birds. They can disperse wherever they want. Yeah. But not all birds are migratory. Not all birds fly very far. And if there's no reason to think you can live in the savanna next door, you're not going to try to fly over it. You, know, you need that consistent habitat in order to allow migration, in order to allow dispersal into a new area. Yeah, animals typically are not voyagers in the fact that they just go in a direction. <laughs> it's not Minecraft. It. Exactly. This is not This is not the mentality of, we know there's an island out there somewhere, because, yeah, if you don't find it in time, then the, you, you die. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> now I'm imagining those swimming sloths swimming across the Central American Seaway singing that song from Moana. Yep. Yep. That's what I, when I once I said Voyagers, that's all I could think of. <laughs> yep. We are not Voyagers. They are, we are descended from Voyagers. If I can't see it, I'm not going. <laughs> On the other hand, cooler and drier time periods would have favored grasslands. And if you have grasslands across your American connection, that's going to be good for your ungulates, you know, your camels and, and things like that to make the trip through habitat they can survive in. Sometimes there's stronger movement in one direction than the other. So some pulses, you see a lot of things moving north to south, other times more south to north. Sometimes you'll see a genus or a species from one continent show up on the other. Other times you'll see a new genus or species appear on one continent, but it'll be like a sloth in North America. Yeah. This came over and evolved into a new species that is now a North American sloth. Overall, across the, the, the length of this exchange, about twice as many mammalian genera, genus, right, genus species, genera, moved from North America to South America as moved the other direction. More than 30 genera are reported to have gone from North to South, whereas less than 20 went from South to North. Which makes sense when you think about the fact that it was an isolated place before they connected and North America was not. Yes. And we'll talk about what some of the impacts were in a bit. But first... Let's talk about who made the trip. Oh boy. 
what creatures made the trek across the continents let's start with which ones made the trip from south to north south american creatures that started appearing in north and central america at this time in terms of mammals lots of those xenarthrans yes most famously ground sloths ground sloths are famous from the north american ice age yeah they're they're iconic yes they are iconic but they were not there before the isthmus of Pan well before the little bit before the isthmus of panama yeah we received them from south america even today there are tree sloths in central america mm -hmm. central america which is part of an area that received them from the south north america also received glyptodonts and pamphyrians the extinct large armored xenarthrans and the one group of these xenarthrans that we still have here in the states armadillos yep it's it's funny when we, to talk about armadillos with people in the south that they are mostly a south american thing because most of them just think of them as backyard pests yes and so it's it's they are not only uh the norm here but they are uh a nuisance yeah they're so common now but only in the last few million years yeah uh, they brought their leprosy and all <laughs> we bring gifts <laughs> <laughs> here we also at least central america received anteaters yay from the south so we got a lot of xenarthrans including lots of pleistocene mega herbivores the ground sloths the glyptodonts the North American Ice Age would not have been the same if yeah, it these weren't were, for these creatures coming over. These were major players during that time. So it, it's it's cool because not only did they come over from South America, but they became core and critical to at least what you know the environment we then saw afterward. So it wasn't that they were just were around; they were in the in the thick of it. Yes. Other mammals that we received, porcupines, cool, moved up here from the south. Capybaras moved into North America later when extinct, but we did have capybaras up here for a bit. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar with capybaras, they are the largest living rodents uh, still down in South America today. They're, they're bigger than your some of the smaller dogs. Yeah, they're ridiculous. They're adorable, too. Oh, Maybe we'll post a picture of them. They're so cool and cute. <laughs> Central America received monkeys from South America. North America had primates way back, but lost them. Yeah. And then this continent did not get primates back until the monkeys came up from South America. I, I learned this. Vampire bats are Ooh. thought to have originated in South America and then moved up here. Very cool. I've also seen it suggested that they came up here, they, that the reason they didn't come up until the interchange is that they were following the large mammals. Yep, yep. Because that's where they get their food. That's really cool. And speaking of groups that were in North America a long time ago, in the exchange, we received our one lone marsupial. <laughs> uh, marsupials, if I remember correctly, are thought to have started in North America in the in the in the cretaceous period if not earlier spread across the world disappeared up here today they are famously from australia lots of possums in south america and one species of marsupial lives in north america the virginia possum and once again it's something so common that no one bats an eye at it for being anything unusual mm -hmm. <clears throat> and even though they're they're named for virginia yes these are descendants of south american ancestors i love that trend because that's something that happens multiple times it's i love telling the story of horses moving around yep but the the idea that animals can originate in an area go extinct in that area and then come back to that area from somewhere else where they spread to is a, is a really interesting concept that happens more often than you would think it in is. the fossil record yeah so if 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 all that is you know, if our understanding is accurate, North America gave South America marsupials in the first place. <laughs> and then in the Pleistocene, the Pleistocene took one back. <laughs> South Here's your change. Here, here, we made it weirder. <laughs> yes. Here, we cooked it for 100 million years. Now you can have it back. 
we put as many teeth in it as we could. <laughs> we it's, gave it a white face mask. Have you seen the Halloween movies? It's kind of <laughs> like that. It's, it's for meme reference, it slaps top of a possum. This thing can fit so many teeth. <laughs> <laughs> we also received a bunch of birds, it seems. It is suspected that things like flycatchers and tanagers and hummingbirds. Oh, cool. Modern hummingbirds are a South American invention that North America received perhaps around the time of the interchange. Neat. Which would also and, make sense because they need plant life to follow up. Yep. And perhaps the most famous bird that moved over during the interchange was one of those terror birds. Excellent. So again, we talked about these in 30, episode 37.5. The forest racids, the terror birds, were a diverse group in South America across the Cenozoic, and one species is known to have made it to North America, and it made it around the time of the Great American Biotic Interchange. Titanus walleri, a seven-foot-tall axe-faced murder demon of a bird. If, if if the fauna of this time could have made movies, that's what their horror movies would have been about. <laughs> this, this, this new creature coming yeah. in and terrorizing the land. Ever since the isthmus formed, they come out at night. <laughs> Mostly. <laughs> So, South America gave us a bunch of creatures, many of which we still have today. Uh, Titanus did not survive to the modern day, most womp, unfortunately. Womp. Wouldn't that be cool if it was still down in Florida, running around the Everglades? <sighs> yeah. I bet you'd have less of an invasive reptile problem. <laughs> <laughs> fewer pets, too. Yeah, you would. Fewer, <laughs> fewer humans. But, North America also generously donated plenty of animals to South America. So creatures that made the north to south transition included tapers, which is another one of those weird ones that tapers started off up here, moved down to South America after the exchange, and went extinct in North America and now are almost exclusively South American animals. Yeah, it's when we tell people we find tapers at the fossil site, they're like, in Tennessee? Yep. That's weird. Well, no, not really. Just Only now. Only now is it weird. We live in a weird time. Yes, exactly. We also donated a bunch of artiodactyls, peccaries, and deer, and camels made the trip down from the north to the south. So a lot of good-sized herbivores. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, more than good-sized herbivores, we gave uh, North America... We, we, North Americans. Yes. North America gave South America gompathiers. Ooh, nice. Shovel-tusked elephants. That's a good one. Uh, which and you can imagine, and, and we're starting to get this sense of the sort of culture shock of what happens when you donate a continent, a an herbivore that's way bigger than anything it's had up to this point. Mm -hmm. Right? Ecosystems are going to be shifting. Lots of rodents move down from North America to South America. Also rabbits. Oh, interesting. Rabbits, uh, uh, perhaps as late as the late Pleistocene, the, the end of the Ice Age, rabbits moved down from north to south. But possibly the most famous group of animals that moved from North America to South America during the interchange were the carnivorans. Yep. Carnivorans are the clade of carnivorous mammals. Lots of mustelids and kin, including the procyonids we mentioned before, raccoons and cousins, mm -hmm. skunks otters, and a bunch of other smaller weasel-like creatures. Canids moved from North America to South America. Wolves and foxes and things like that. Felids, very famously. Yes. Cats. Uh, including saber-toothed cats, mountain lions, which at one point had a north to south distribution across both of the Americas. Which is makes their current situation all the sadder. It does. <laughs> and jaguars. Yep. Are one of those. Th it's another one of those things we produced for South America. And man, did they do well down there. They're eating those tapers that we gave them. <laughs> <laughs> and bears. Yay. Notably, the giant short-faced bears and other short-faced bears. Uh, the spectacled bear down there is a member of the short-faced bear group that uh, is still down there today. And it's basically the remaining member of that lineage 
Yes, which is it is. Cool. It, it's added as it's uh, South America is acted as a refugium for short faced bears in that way. Yeah, just that one species. Just that one. That's the weirdest cool thing about this to me is that thing of you can see evidence of it today from this interchange with what we have in both spots. It is extra weird when they are no longer in the spot they came from. Yep. Yeah, we think the jaguar is the iconic South American. Oh, it's the big cat. It's the America. big cat, and it's and it's iconic in their culture. You know, like you can see it in the carvings of the Aztecs, and oh yeah, it's it's a huge part of the culture down there. Uh, but until fairly recently, geologically, there were no cats. Yes, that's crazy. It's it's I. And this is one of the reasons, side note, I love paleontology. <laughs> I love seeing how things developed. I love mm-hmm. the history. I love reading the history of the Earth, knowing how it ends, yes. and watching all the pieces fall into place. It's fascinating, because it reveals those things that you always assumed was the way you know it. There were also birds that made the trip from North America to South America, including groups like wrens and swallows and sparrows. Some reptiles, and reptiles are a little harder to know because their fossil record's not quite as good in this regard. Bummer. But snapping turtles appear to have been a North American group that made it to the South. And a number of snakes, including uh, most probably rattlesnakes. Cool. We're a North American group that is now widespread across both continents. And then at the, you know, very, very late in the Pleistocene, right at the end of the, of the Ice Age, the last glacial period, South America received perhaps its least welcome <laughs> import from North America, uh, humans. Yep. Sorry about that one, guys. Our That's bad. our bad. Yeah, that one's on us. So you can see that over the course of these various pulses of exchange, the North and South American ecosystems were really overhauled by this connection. And this had a number of really interesting impacts on the ecosystem. You know, the last three million years of ecosystems have really responded to this in dramatic ways. Most notably, South America did not fare great. Nope. Uh, There were a lot of extinctions uh, in South America. A lot of those native groups, those weird South American ungulates, their cool marsupials, including their big marsupial carnivores, do not make it past the Gabi. Some of these extinctions uh, may have happened leading up to the Gabi, so they weren't necessarily all associated with the interchange. Some of these might have been on their way out beforehand. Others may have happened as a direct consequence of the influx of new creatures. And then, of course, once the Pleistocene came around, there was the major extinctions at the end of the Pleistocene that took out the glyptodons and the ground sloths and things like that. In total, when you look at modern-day ecosystems, about half of the mammal genera in South America today are northern mammals. Yeah, yeah. North American groups have taken over South America. This has, you know, this came along with some interesting shifts in ecosystem structure. So we've mentioned a couple times the carnivorous comparisons. Mm -hmm. Before the interchange, the dominant carnivores in South America for much of the Cenozoic were those marsupials, were the terror birds, crocs, large snakes, the madsoids, which we mentioned in episode three. Yeah. After the interchange, a lot of those diminish, and the top predators are small canids, small early dog relatives like Protocyon and Theriodictus, those cats we talked about, the saber tooth, the mountain lion, the jaguar, and bears, notably Arctotherium. Woo! The giant, the, the most giant of giant short faced bears. <laughs> the giantest short faced bear that ever was. Arctotherium is thought uh, by some to have been hypercarnivorous. And indeed, I found a paper by Soibelzin and Schubert. Hey, we know that guy. Hey, I recognize that one. That suggested that it's possible that Arctotherium was able to become so large and so predatory 
because it moved to a continent with very little competition and a ton of things to eat. And then as time goes on, you see them, uh, the short-faced bears down there, become smaller and more herbivorous as the other as the carnivore guild sort of developed down in south america that's fascinating they they had an open season but then as everyone else caught up it just wasn't it wasn't as beneficial to them alone yes and this is even more fascinating there is potential evidence that the creatures that did survive in south america started evolving in response to this notably glyptodonts the big armored volkswagen beetle mammals and their relatives you start to see more spiky bits <laughs> after the gabby that's fantastic they had to start carrying knives <laughs> yeah they needed protection you also <laughs> it's been pointed out by some that you also see more large burrows after the gabby and one study found that the most successful colonizers across both continents were the ones that had the best anti-predator traits. Oh, man. North America made South America a bad neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it did. Uh, they're oh, coming man. over, sending their the, the cats and dogs and bears to eat oh. all of our, our cute noto ungulates and capybaras. Gee, I'm... S oh, sorry, South America. That's... <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, we really we really mucked it up down there. <laughs> so there's evidence that predators were a huge factor in the way ecosystems shifted uh, over the course of the Gabby. Now, we hinted at this a little bit earlier. Many paleontologists have wondered why did the northern groups dominate over the southern groups? Mm -hmm. uh, one suggestion that I read that's pretty neat is that Central America was a tropical environment, so moving through Central America gave migrants an opportunity to adapt for what is essentially the rest of South America. Interesting. So if you made it through the center, you were pre-adapted to live all across the tropics of South America, but South American faunas wouldn't have dealt with the temperate climates of North America until they already got there. Yeah, yeah. So it, it'd be more of a climactic shock for South American animals moving up yeah. versus North American uh, animals moving down. And then the other explanation, cool. the, the explanation that I'm very familiar with, as are you, is that North America was not isolated. Nope. North America was, for tens of millions of years, competing on a global stage. Yeah. Connected to Europe and Asia and Africa which meant that there was broader competition, broader diversity available. You were brought up in a more competitive arena in North America. So when you got down to South America, which was sheltered, sort of isolated in its little bubble, not receiving much input from the outside world, they kind of did their own thing and were unprepared for the North American creatures that had been training in the hard zone. Yep. For the whole Cenozoic. It's it's like uh, North America had gone through more trial tests. Yes. So they were optimized, you know, so to say, more than the South American a animals. It's it's kind of like um how you can have certain ways of doing things in a small town that wouldn't be competitive for large scale business, like. You can have a small town business that can, you know, oh, absolutely, we can custom make each thing for you. But if you want to do that on a global scale, it's just not as efficient. Yep, most definitely. So the Great American Biotic Interchange shaped modern faunas of North America and South America. Some came out better than others. We can blame the Gabby, perhaps, for some of the losses of those yep. cool South American creatures. And then that has continued to this day, you know. Uh, the Pleistocene glacial cycles came in, and those continued to shape ecosystems. As we mentioned, it's fascinating to look at how our modern familiar things uh, were developed over the course of this event. There are a couple other side effects of the, the formation of the Isthmus of Panama 
that I want to mention before we wrap it up both relate to the fact that while this was a connection for the continents, it was a separation for the oceans. Yeah. The Central American Seaway, for a long time, between the continents, was home to reefs and mangroves and things like that. And the Pacific organisms and the Caribbean organisms were very similar so in terms of what lived in their communities until around three to four million years ago. Once the connection was cut off, you see this proliferation of reefs, corals and other reef builders in the Caribbean. Now that you are in this sort of little nook area and the ocean creatures on either side start to diverge. So we see the opposite. Yes. Instead of seeing things become more similar, we see things become more different on either side of the isthmus. Whenever the land meets, the oceans are separated. Yep. And... It also separated currents. And that's where it gets interesting. Oh boy, get ready. Do you remember, Will and listeners, the movie The Day After Tomorrow? Yep. In the movie, the plot of the movie, the kind of scientific plot of the movie, is that the North American current shuts down. Yes. What they're referring to is the fact that today, there is a current that runs up the eastern side of North America carries all this warm salty water way up to the north keeping northern europe nice and toasty mm -hmm. the salty water cools down sinks and then that deeper current flows back down south and you create this conveyor belt system yes this is called a thermohaline current because it is driven by differences in temperature and salinity haline halite salt while the Central American Seaway was great for balancing the salinity of the Pacific and the Atlantic, because the Atlantic is saltier than the Pacific, mm -hmm. because of trade winds. They carry moisture over to the Pacific. Once the isthmus formed and the oceans were separated, the Atlantic was able to become more salty. It was not losing, it was not exchanging salinity with the Pacific quite as much, which potentially led to a stronger North American current, which meant more moisture being transported to the north. And more moisture means more precipitation, which in the north means snow and ice, which in the north means sea ice and ice sheets. And when you get the development of sea ice and ice sheets, you not only trap heat under the ice sheets in the water, but you kick off what's called the albedo effect. Oh. Ice is very reflective. It reflects sunlight, and with that reflected sunlight, it reflects heat. It might not be a coincidence that the closure of the Isthmus of Panama happens at around the same time that the Quaternary glaciation cycles start. This event may have contributed to the kickstarting of the Ice Age cycles of the Pliocene and Pleistocene. This is that butterfly effect that they, they always <laughs> yep. like to one switch can have a domino effect to huge proportions. Yep. And my favorite little bit of butterfly effect here is that if the closure of the Isthmus of Panama contributed to increasing ice in the north, contributing to lower temperatures, lower temperatures in glacial cycles means more ice forming and more water trapped in glacial ice in the north, which means lower sea levels which would have expanded the Isthmus of Panama. Yep. So the Isthmus may have created the conditions to make itself wider. Which is, it's that feedback loop. It's really interesting. And it's, and, you know, the the east and west coast today is are still vastly different. Oh, you know, yeah. The, on, on average, the west coast is probably, you know, almost 20 degrees Fahrenheit colder. Here in North America, you mean? And here in North America, mm -hmm. then the East Coast of North America, and it's well, we get all that warm water coming up. Exactly, and they get cold water coming down from the north. So, Great American Biotic Interchange, more than just a biotic interchange, changed climate patterns, ocean current patterns, ocean communities, and especially the terrestrial ecosystems we see today in North and South America. This is one of those fascinating subjects that's still being looked into. More information being discovered all the time. But for now, we will wrap up our discussion of the Gabby 
And now, perhaps, hopefully, you have a better sense of why I said in the beginning that this was one of the most significant geologic events of the last 60 million years. Truly, both literally and figuratively, shaped the world we lived in. Yep. And as you said, the effects not only can still be seen by the animals we see here, but we can still see things moving. You know, things like armadillos are still moving farther north as climate shift. So it's this. this is not something that happened and we can see the side effects today. This is the world we are now still living in. Yeah, this connection. Is... The interchange has not stopped, nor yep. will it ever stop until we lose the connection. Yep. Uh, I would love to see, and I have no clue, I'm sure people have looked into this, is how things like the Panama Canal affected stuff. Oh, yes. It's, <laughs> there's a long discussion to be had about how human activities oh, yeah. have impacted movements across regions it's yeah that, that's a whole a whole topic unto itself but it's for this one particularly it is very interesting it's it's a cool event and we got cool animals moving both ways because of it we did now before we wrap up today we have uh, we've had a few of these before a patron question bum, ba, dum, bum, bum. one of the goodies that our patrons get access to is the ability to send us questions that we will occasionally answer on the podcast and speaking of isolated land masses this one's a really cool question from nils on patreon who asked do we know what was going on in india while it was sailing up towards asia after having broken off from africa and madagascar the flora and fauna would surely have been isolated there for millions of years much like australia and madagascar did any of the endemic Indian species migrate into Eurasia? Good question. This is a very good question. If you listen to episode 40, we talked about Madagascar's isolation and endemism, unique ecosystems. We talked about South America today. I did a little bit of digging into India, and I haven't done a ton of digging, so I'm, I'm by no means an expert. We, we maybe will do a whole episode on this at some point. But from my quick literature scan, what I found is that Early Cenozoic India, so the time period where it would have been broken off from Gondwana and moving up before it connected to Asia, shows surprisingly little endemism. Interesting. Which is to say, the isolated, quote, India during the time period when it was supposedly isolated, does not appear to have been very isolated. Hmm. There have been a, there are a number of studies that I came across that showed map primates and carnivorous mammals and hoofed mammals and crocs and snakes and turtles and insects many appear to be very similar to the species you see at that time in asia and europe in the southern continents so it may be that india wasn't quite as isolated that there may have been enough occasional land connections and island chains to allow a consistent exchange even as it moved up from the south to the north. Very intriguing. I saw one article, <clears throat> I saw one paper that suggested that as you watch over time in this time period in India, the southern connections, the ecosystem sort of components of the ecosystem that are similar to southern continents become less important while northern connections become more dominant until it finally actually connects with asia that's cool so this is one of those wonderful moments in science where we ask hey here's a thing that should be true and then we look and it's not and it's <laughs> and it's weird and we don't as far as i could tell not entirely sure why that is right but india did not do what madagascar did and what australia did and what south america did for some reason or another very intriguing I have, no, I have no guesses. <laughs> I mean, it, either you had islands or, or more connections than we thought, or the movement of India happened differently. That maybe it connected with Asia earlier or, or disconnected with others a little later. That's what I was wondering, if it somehow pre-got the fauna to match up yeah. earlier on somehow. Geology is a complicated and confusing matter. <laughs> the world may never know. I hope we know. But for now, that's that's the answer we have. The very surprising and 
fascinating answer to Nils' very question. Cool. Thank you very much to Nils for submitting that. And to Nils and our other suggestors for suggesting this topic. And to you listeners for joining us for this episode of the Common Descent Podcast. As always, there will be a blog post that goes up after this talking with with links to more information and some pictures to show you what we're talking about. Keep an eye out for that. Keep an eye out over the next couple months for more of the cool stuff we're going to be putting out, our Spotlight series yeah. and our October series and our movie discussions and all the other stuff. <laughs> As always, we love to hear from you. Send us emails and social media messages. Tell us what you like. Tell us what you'd like to hear. Give us feedback. We'd love to hear from you. Indeed. We covered a big event today. We had a big event over the weekend. I, I, I don't know if I mentioned it in the beginning, but our, my voice is just a little bit shot. Oh, yeah. We're, we are both still recovering from the con. I'm fighting just a bit of con funk. So, yeah, it, it was busy, busy. So we are going to wrap up this recording and go to sleep. Yes. Good night, listeners. Dream sweet dreams of the world that might have been if we still had all those cool South American critters. Yeah. Bye for now. See you, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.